KCLA presents UCLA Sports. Today, the Bruin Athletic Year. Well, I think the opening game of the 1967 football season really amounted to the first bowl game of the year between the Bruins and the Tennessee Volunteers. In the Coliseum, on a Saturday night, more than 66,000 people had come. Everybody remembered that wild 1965 game. 6-7, win for Tennessee. And it matched quarterbacks Gary Beban and Dewey Warren, two young men with extraordinary flair. Tennessee recovered an opening kickoff fumble by UCLA. From the 19-yard line, the Volunteers put it in the end zone in just four plays as Charlie Fulton scored the touchdown and Tennessee had a 7-0 lead. Bruins stiffened on defense as the game wore on, led by the great play of Don Manning, the linebacker, and Gary Beban finally was able to shake off some tough moments like this one when Mike Jones intercepted a pass stopping the Bruins. Tennessee with the football on their own 45, but there UCLA held, and late in the second quarter, Greg Jones, sophomore from South San Francisco, started to move things here with a 23-yard gallop. This seemed to fire up the entire UCLA football team. And in four plays later, the Bruins settled for three points from another sophomore who was about ready to go to work on the record book. Zenon Andrews, a 37-yard field goal, made it 7-3 halftime. In the third quarter, Tennessee capitalized on another UCLA fumble. And Richard Pickens drove in for the touchdown, and Tennessee led 13-3. But from their own 22, UCLA started. Speed by this 22-yard burst over the middle on a key third down and five play by Rick Purdy. UCLA scored its first touchdown of the ball game as Gary Beban turned inside right in. Great blocking from Murphy and Bima, and Gary skittered in. And position kick made it 13-10 for Tennessee. Greg Jones... A surprise with an, a spectacular beginning of his varsity college football career. A twisting 12-yard game here to keep the Bruins on the move. And Don Manning continued to intimidate the Volunteers with defensive plays like this as he shoots down Charlie Fulton for a six-yard loss. Still 13-10 at the end of three quarters. Andrew Zichon's second field goal made it 13-13 in the final quarter. Spencer then hit from 35 yards, and Tennessee led 16-13. But Greg Jones and Rick Purdy, getting precision blocking from the front line, continued to move the football, like this first by Purdy, 10 yards of a left tackle. And Greg Jones comes back with a tremendous play around left end. Everybody said the sophomore would be good, but nobody said he would be this great in his first varsity game. On fourth and two on the Tennessee 27, a memorable football play, one that will live in the annals of UCLA grid history forever. A 27-yard letter-perfect run by Gary Beban for the touchdown to make it 20 to 16. That's the way the ball game ended as the UCLA Bruins kept Dewey Warren off balance and the game came to a close with Warren flat of his back. Great way to begin a season. Next came Pittsburgh on a cool afternoon in western Pennsylvania. That series stood at four wins each. UCLA Bruins won the toss. They elected to receive and Pittsburgh kicked it into the air. The Bruins started the march on their own 38-yard line. The action started with a bang as Jerry Beaven went right to the air. He hit Greg Jones on the 40-yard line. Jones running down the sideline, hit from behind, turned the ball loose. Pittsburgh recovered. The Panthers picked up a couple of first downs, but then they too lost the ball on a fumble, and the Bruins started to move from the Pittsburgh 47. First and goal later on the nine as Gary Beeman sweeps right in. Bang, bang, blocking. Goes in for the touchdown and the Bruins lead. 7-0, eight minutes to go in the first quarter. Andrew Zichon's 25-yard field goal made it 10-0. And then Gary Beeman caps the 48-yard drive, dashing around left end, and the halftime score was UCLA 17, Pittsburgh nothing. A 40-yard drive made it 24-0 in the third quarter with Rick Purdy scoring. And with Bill Bolden pulling the trigger now for the Euclid's, Greg Jones gets nine yards. That's Rick Purdy, again showing that he would be one of the better fullbacks in the country. And now watch as Greg Jones turns in the longest scoring scamper of his young career. Comes off to the left, just simply outruns people, and goes for the touchdown. A game of 160 yards on 19 carries for Greg Jones. At the end of the quarter, 30-0 UCLA over Pitt. The Panthers got one early in the final period with a score reading 30-8. Pittsburgh, second and 15 on their 28, goes to the air under pressure. Mark Gustafson intercepts and then races 46 yards for his touchdown. And that makes the score 37 0 as Andrew Zichon adds a late field goal. And the final score was UCLA 40 and Pittsburgh 8. So the Bruins had 
won one from a real tough one, Tennessee, and picked off one against a ball club that was not considered so tough, but the Bruins made it look so easy, they were way up in the national ranking. It was quite clear that UCLA had a bright future in collegiate football in 67. The play had been crisp, everything had been just fine to this point. Next in line were the Cougars of Washington State and the Nittany Lions of Penn State. 19th meeting between the Bruins and the Cougars. Game played in Spokane's Albee Stadium. The Bruins lost at the outset of the ball game, but that was about the only time they were to lose all day. They kicked off to the Cougars, and from there, the Cougars went to work, surprising everybody, including certainly the Bruins, as Washington State zoomed right back up the field. And uh, Jerry Henderson at quarterback, handling the ball very well, faking beautifully, gives it away to Mark Williams, and the little speedster dashed in, and UCLA uh, was behind 7 to nothing. But Zena and Andrewsition came back with a 32-yard field goal to make it 7 to 3, and the Bruins took the lead late in the first quarter, 10 to 7, then 17-7, as Sandy Green picked off a Jerry Henderson pass. Jerry Beaven put the second touchdown on the board with a long pass to split in Dave Nuttall, play covering 49 yards, most of it through the air, and at this point, some of the air started to go out of the Cougar balloon. Andrew Zitchin made the point in his 17-7 after the third quarter. UCLA lost the scoring chance early in the third quarter when Gary Beaven fumbled inside the Cougar 10, but later started a scoring drive from the 41. Hit on a pass to Rick Spindler for nine yards, and four plays later, Gary jammed over the middle for the touchdown. The kick good, 24-7 UCLA. Henderson, the Cougar quarterback, stayed in the air. Linebacker Don Manning picks it off here, runs it back 22 yards. Bruins had it, first and 10 on the Washington State 17. Manning's only interception so far in the season, but he had really been something. By this point, the outcome of the game was no longer in doubt, just, I guess, a matter of score, and Rick Purdy was having quite a day himself as he hits up the middle here for six yards, puts the ball down on the Washington State 11. But again, this no one-man team, no sir. As Gary Beaven calls on Greg Jones, and Jones lashes into the end zone, it's 31-7 Bruins late in the third quarter. Safety against the Cougars, field goal by Andrew Zitchin makes it 36-7, and Bill Bolden at quarterback now for UCLA. Rolls out, turns in, goes 16 yards, first down, Cougar 38. Big Bill now starting to enjoy himself, comes right back with another gainer around the right end, good for 11 yards. Bruins really asserting themselves now that they've got their second win. And six plays later, Bolden kept again from the three, ran for the flag, and went in standing up. 43-15, UCLA with a minute 26 to play in the ball game. Washington State scored 80 yards on a pass run play. 43-23, and then Bill Bolden came back with a 55-yard scoring scamper. It was a dandy. UCLA 51, Washington State 23. And certainly by this time, the Bruins stock nationally was way up and the ticket sales were too. The first rough day of the 1967 season came in a place where it's always rough. That's in the heartland of Pennsylvania where Penn State University is located. Nittany Lions were one and one when the Bruins got to town, losing by a point to Navy, but had beat Miami soundly. A standing room crowd on hand as the game got underway. Bruins stalled after the kickoff. Third down, Andrew Zitchin in punt formation had to run the ball, wound up short of a first down, and Penn State was in business. This is Bob Campbell, a tailback, and he shows some nifty form as he breaks loose for 32 yards down the sidelines, and suddenly you get the message, this one will not be easy. From the 36-yard line, the Lions bang and splash down to the six, and on third and four, Campbell runs off the right side for the touchdown, and Penn State is out in front. Seven to nothing. The massive home crowd of more than 48,000 really turning it on here. And the Penn State defense really dug in. Greg Jones cuts back into the middle and finds some running room, six yards, to make it third and one on the Bruins' 20-yard line. They give it to Jones again. He tries the middle, but he came up empty. He needed a yard for the first down, and Andrew Zitchin had to come in to punch with his goal line at his back. Andrew Zitchin needed a big one here because at this point of the game, the momentum belonged to Penn State. Well... He got 47 yards on the kick, and the Bruins were something out of a hole here. Ball took a UCLA roll for a 47-yard net kick for Andrew Zitchin. 7 up in Penn State after the quarter. Each team missed field goal opportunities in the second quarter, and it has become a bruising defensive struggle. Rick Purdy, trying for yardage against the Penn State defense, finds very little. And then Gary Beaven having all kinds of trouble, as Frank Spaziani hits him from the side for an 8-yard loss. And on a third down and 18, a big sophomore tackle with the incredible name of Steve 
Neer, who had a great first pass, comes in and he decks Stephen for a 10-yard loss. And position later missed another field goal try from 44 yards, and it was 7-0 Penn State at the half. But Penn State, who received the start the second half, lost the handle on the football, had it on their own 28. Sherman caught it on the snap. He was overrun by the white shirt from UCLA, but he was able to recover for a four-yard loss, and after some discussion from the Bruins, he finally was able to put the ball back in play. They pitch it out here to Campbell, a triple sweater. He throws the pass. It is incomplete, and the Bruin linemen now are starting to get penetration against Penn State. On third and 14, Tom Sherman goes to the air. He's looking for Campbell, but Sandy Green makes the interception, and the Bruins now have the football in good field position. But they can't move it. And position misses from the State 39. But in the late stages of the quarter, the Bruins finally did start to go on a pass to Dave Nuttall for 34 yards and a first down on the State 22. But watch that smear, fella, again. Number 76. He plugs the hole and he comes in to get a piece of Gary Beaven for a yard loss. But Beaven comes back to the air and goes to Nuttall and it works for seven yards. Dave hit hard, hangs on to the football, and a play later, Andrew Zichon hits the field goal from 37 yards to make it 7-3. In the fourth quarter, Penn State in punt formation, the Bruins split. Eight men, Dick Lepisco, blocks the ball, Hal Griffin follows to the end zone, and suddenly, that quick, it's 10-7. And the Bruins are on top. And after Penn State had punted, the Bruins came thundering back as Stephen fires to Harold Busby, completed the end zone, but there's laundry on the land. A red flag, the touchdown is nullified. So from the 11-yard line, Stephen throws again, and this one is intercepted by Wallace Serafasi on the two-yard line. A roughness penalty against UCLA moves State out to their own 20. And it started looking pretty grim at this point. But the Euclid's working slowly and steadily, started marching toward the end zone. After they had absorbed this penalty, they came pounding right back. First and goal on the state six. Rick Purdy and Paul Durflinger doing most of the hard work with Greg Jones now out of the game with a shoulder separation. And second and goal on the state three. Stephen calls his own number and goes into the end zone behind great blocking. The kick is good. It is 17-7 UCLA over Penn State. But the Lions didn't quit. No, sir. Sherman throwing. Sherman running. Sherman doing most everything required. Again, the penalty flag is down. Andy Herrera calls for interference, and Pitt State has a first down and goal to go on the UCLA two-yard line. Charlie Pittman now in the ball game, as Penn State had lost their swifty Bob Campbell to injury. Tom Terry tried the middle of the line, and finally slides in and over for the touchdown. The Lions want to go for two. They do go for two, and they get it, as Sherman, faking the pass, runs it in for the two, and it's 17 to 15. With a minute to play and more noise than you can imagine possible from the 48,000-plus people, Penn State tried an onside kick, but the Bruins covered on their own 37 and ran out the clock winning 17-15 to 15 in one of the roughest, toughest college football games I think that I have ever seen. The crowd level, of course, was uh, very much involved in all of the post-game conversation because both quarterbacks admitted they had trouble hearing uh, are conversing with their teammates and some of the people who went out in flanker and split in positions couldn't hear at all they just played pretty much by instinct the Bruins were bruised but they had won four straight games and old folk Cal was coming to town it was a foggy night in old Los Angeles town for the 38th meeting between the California Golden Bears and the UCLA Bruins at the Coliseum about 49,000 people were on hand the Bears won the toss and they elected to receive and they went to work in typical California fashion. On the third play of the game, Mark Gustafson had the first big play of the ball game, though. On second and 23, Mark picked off a Barry Bronx pass. And the Bruins had the ball on the California 23. On the first scrimmage play, Rick Purdy bowled for 10 yards. The Bears helped the Bruins with a roughness call. And all of a sudden, the ball is on the California six-yard line, burst and goal. Two plays later, however, it's back on the 10 third and goal, and Gary Beaven goes to the air, throws for Dave not all a sensational diving catch, and the Bruins lead after two minutes and 19 seconds, seven to nothing. Second time the Bruins got the ball, Rick Purdy planting off left guard, got some tremendous blocking from the front line, and ran for 17 yards to the California 41-yard line. Well, when the horse has got room, or when he's hot, let him go, and Rick Purdy this time, running with the football, had some room, but he is twisted loose from the ball, and Mike McCaffrey recovers for California. The Bears couldn't move it. Kick to the Bruins. The long drive moves the ball inside the Cal 20. 
Purdy picks up five yards on a set play. The still the Bruins a five short of the first down. Zenon ends the position from the 27-yard line. It's good. And it's a lead for UCLA early in the first quarter of nine to nothing. With Barry Brock, Cal is a passing team and a good one. Brock gets George Gearhart for 11 yards. Puts the ball on the UCLA 37. Brock again goes to the air and throws to Gary Fowler. Fowler, who had quite a good night against UCLA, makes the catch. And it works for the touchdown after the scramble by Brock. And suddenly, it's a 9-7 ball game early in the second quarter. From their 26, after the kickoff, the Bruins start to move again. Beaven keeps for 12 yards. But Beaven having some trouble running the corners, goes back to the air and throws to Dave Nuttall for 14 yards. And again, California helps with a personal foul. Make it first down on the Bear 30-yard line. Bears, of course, wearing the dark blue shirt. Paul Durflinger replacing the injured Greg Jones at the left halfback position was in the ball game on this two foggy night, and Paul Durflinger played quite a role in UCLA's victory against California. Here we see Durflinger running for seven yards. On third and goal now from the California six-yard line, watch Stephen as he throws to Busby in the end zone. The play just misses, but again, California gets the red flag. This time, interference, and the ball is down on the California one-yard line. Sort of an academic call from here, as Gary Beaven called his own number at the football behind wedge blocking, moves into the end zone, and UCLA takes the lead, 16-7, to marching 74 yards in 11 plays. Later in the second quarter, the Bruins started from their own 45 as Stephen hit Nuttall on the Cal 44 for 11 yards. And then Gary comes right back with another shot, this one to Harold Busby, and this one's good for 14 yards, and the first down on the California 30. And now the Bear defensive secondary is really guessing. Maybe it's the fog. But nonetheless, Stephen keeps them guessing as he goes around left end for 11 yards, puts the ball down on the California 19. From the first down on the California 19, it's another pass to Dave Nuttall. And on this play, Dave showed that he can move with the ball once he gets his hands on it. Takes it on the five, runs it across, and at halftime, UCLA led 23 to 7 over California. Late in the third quarter, Beaven to tight end Rich Spindler, good for 20 yards. And then Mike Garrett was in the backfield for the UCLA Bruins. And this big sophomore, it's over right tackle for eight yards to put the ball on the Cal 15. Right back to Garrett again. And then Rick Purdy at right tackle for the touchdown. 30 to seven on Andrew Zitchin's kick and the UCLA Bruins have the big lead. But California didn't quit. They blocked Zena and Andrew Zitchin's field goal try from the Cal 49. Rick Lavin recovered and California had the football on their own 48 yard line. With rifle arm Barry Bronk at quarterback. He throws to John Fay for 10 yards, and Cal has the ball in UCLA territory, moving now against many Bruin reserves. Brock stays in the air, trying for the touchdown. Throws here to Paul Williams. Play works for 13 yards, down to the UCLA 29. Gary Fowler, the recipient of another Barry Bronx pass here. This one good for 12 yards. Puts the ball down on the UCLA 17. Brock, one of the best passers in the country, Fires over the middle to Fowler again. Fowler buggy whipping the football, rather Bronx buggy whipping the football in the direction of Fowler, who turned out to be a prime receiver on that night. And then finally Barry Bronx tops the drive with a one-yard fun, 52 yards, eight plays, Cal on the board, UCLA 30, California 14. Later a Bronx pass was picked off by Steve, uh, Steve Smalley. UCLA got possession. Three plays later. It was Bill Bolden who figured uh, in the pass to Mike Garrett, but here at the interception, as Brock with time, lost the football to the forming UCLA defensive secondary, and Bill Bolden put his mark in the California UCLA series as he threw to Mike Garrett. The final score after that touchdown, 37 to 10, and the UCLA Bruins had their fifth straight win. The Sanford Indians, with a record of three wins and two losses after five games, were ready when the Bruins arrived on the farm up at center. A crowd of some 47,000 sitting to watch on a sunny afternoon at Sanford City. 
The Bruins took the kick off and set sail from their own 22 as Gary Beaver chased out of the passing pocket, runs around left hand for 12 yards. Then Rick Purdy hits up the middle and goes for nine yards against Sanford. Sanford in the dark shirt here. Gary Beaven on second and eight gets superb blocking around left end and goes for 15 yards to put the ball down on the Sanford 33-yard line. Just steps out of bounds. On second and 13, Beaven threw his second pass of the game. It was good to Rich Spindler for 12 yards down to the Sanford 14. Beaven then hands off to Rick Purdy. And by this time, Rick was becoming known as Rick the Wrecker. And he puts the ball down on the five-yard line. And two plays later, Mike Garrett flashed across for the touchdown. Bruins had the point, And it was 7 nothing with 78 yards in just 13 plays. The Indians came to play, though. The Bruins had the ball on the stand for 23, third and one. Durfling had tried for the one, and he came up empty. And the next call, the Bruins go back to Rick Purdy, who's been a money man all season. But Sanford gets right on the defensive stunt and stops Purdy and takes the ball. Then little Chuck Williams goes to work at his quarterback position, passing to Gene Washington for seven yards. And big running halfback Nate Pertman gets a big block here from fullback Jack Root and turns it on for eight yards. And all of a sudden, Sanford is starting to move the ball. On fourth and one on the Bruins 39, Williams fakes brilliantly. Bill Shoemaker, fullback, slips in behind, makes the catch behind Mark Gustafson. And all of a sudden, Sanford's got a touchdown. The score is tied. In the second quarter, Sanford got a lift from this 30-yard gallop by Nate Kirkman. Off right tackle. Takes the ball all the way to the UCLA two-yard line. The Bruins got pretty tough, pretty mean down around here. And Sanford mishandled the ball. Settled for a field goal, 27-yarder from Bill Shoemaker. But Sanford led 10-7. Later in the quarter, first and 31 for the Indians. And again, little Chuck Williams goes to the air. But this time, Sandy Green takes it off, and he brings it back to the Bruins' 48-yard line. Then the Bruins started their drive. The big play, a 13-yard gallop over tackle by Rick Purdy to put the ball down on the Stanford 19-yard line. And then Gary Beban called the fullback up the middle, but without telling anybody, he elected to keep the ball himself and just ran outside to left in and scampered in for the touchdown to make it 14-10 UCLA halftime. Third quarter, the Bruins started on their 20. Gary Beaven throwing to Rick Purdy, a play good for 30 yards. That was Beaven's 200th career completion, which is another school record at this point. The ball is down on the stand for 30. The third and goal, another call up the middle. Beaven again keeps the ball and goes around the right side and goes in standing to make it 21-10 on Andrew Zishin's kick. Well, Stanford came right back. On their 19-yard line, the Bruins held Stanford on fourth and one. But the Indians just kept pounding away, getting a break here and there. And finally, little Chuck Williams, who stands on the 5-9, chased out of the pass, ran for 38 yards to put the ball down on the UCLA 17-yard line, first and 10. On second down and seven, Shoemaker again beat Sandy Green in the deep secondary with a great catch, good for 11 yards. And a play later, big fullback Jack Root lunges over for the touchdown. The two-point conversion attempt misses. Williams passing for Bueller. It's still 21 to 16. But the Indians at the very close of the ball game were still scratching a couple of first downs, and Sandy Green finally managed to cut in front of Dean Washington and pick off a Williams pass. The Bruins couldn't really turn it loose then because Sanford kept the pressure on all the way. And with less than 20 seconds to play, Williams hit Washington for 26 yards, the Bruins 16. A touchdown would win it for Stanford. A clock running. Williams missed. Second and 10. Williams looking into the end zone, obviously, and throwing with great precision. But he misses in the end zone. Intended for George Bueller. And the clock just about to run out. One more play. One more pass. A touchdown would win it. UCLA leading 21 to 16. One of the most exciting finishes of the entire 1967 season. The ball was in the air as the gun sounded an incompleted forward pass. The Bruins won it 21 to 16, but it certainly was not easy that day on the farm. So there were four games to go. UCLA had won six in a row. Oregon State, Washington, USC, and Syracuse, all of them in the Coliseum. But oh, what trouble there was to come. The final four games on any football schedule in any year always very tough because this is where the traditional rivalry comes to play. Oregon State was in the Coliseum against the UCLA Bruins November 4, 1967, the first of the final four games for the Bruins. UCLA kicked off Oregon State 
took the receiving and from their own 20-yard line in four plays moved it only one yard. So we pick it up on punt situation for Oregon State with Gary Hauser kicking to Mark Gustafson back on the UCLA 37. Mark comes back to the 44, fumbles when he is hit hard by Rogers, and the white-shirted Oregon State Beavers recover on the UCLA 38, this in the first quarter. Well, on first and 10, the triple threat quarterback for the Oregon State Beavers showed us some of his class, a young man named Steve Priest, who is back for 1968. And here on the option, after being run out of the pocket, Priest starts to go, gets tremendous blocking around the corner, and he runs for 35 yards to a first and goal on the UCLA three before the blue-clad Bruins can finally drag him down. Sandy Green on the tackle. So on the next play, the Beavers did just exactly what you would expect they would do. Go to their big 230-pound fullback, Bill Inyard, and watch him thump in over the right side. Bruins hit him at the line of scrimmage. They get him down on one knee at least before he gets into the end zone, and he picks up two yards. But Inyard is not to be denied, and on the next play, drives in over right tackle and scores the touchdown that puts Oregon State out in front. Mike Haggard does the kicking for Oregon State, and he was to play a very prominent role in this football game. So with two minutes and 35 seconds played in the game, Oregon State leads seven to nothing. The quarter coming to a close, Oregon State comes right back as Priest runs around left end and goes in across the line of scrimmage, laterals back to Billy Summers, and Summers scores, but the Oregon State line ruled offside, and the play comes back to the 15. So... Steve Priest goes to the air this time on the sprint-out pass pattern and under pressure delivers his pass and he hits Roger Kaplan down on the five-yard line as the quarter comes to a close with Oregon State leading UCLA 7 to nothing. The first play of the second quarter. And again, we see the work of Bill Inyard, who hits you like a runaway truck. He goes into the left side of the line and the big guy is stopped just short of the goal line. Oregon State claiming touchdown, UCLA holding, according to the officials who were right there on the spot, and called the play dead, short of the goal line, and the Bruins get it first and ten, just in the shadow of the goal. Well, the Bruins finally get moving in the second quarter, and on second and ten at their own 40, Gary Beeman here goes to Ron Copeland. The pass is good. On the nine-yard line, and Copeland canters in. But... For the second time in the ball game, we have a touchdown called back because of a penalty. The Bruins' backfield moving too soon. So instead of tying the score, the Bruins are still short by seven. Gary Beeman is the quarterback. And again, he goes to the air looking for Gwen Cooper. And he finds Cooper. And Cooper takes the football down to the Oregon State 28-yard line to play good for 16 yards. So now with the first and 10 on the 28th, Watch the Bruin fullback number 33, Rick Purdy, who had quite a season in 1967, and he too is back for 68. Bolts off left tackle. He's hit from behind. The football loose. The Beavers jump on it. But the play was ruled dead, and UCLA retains possession. So Gary Beaven, off the shifting eye formation, tucks the ball under, gets a good block from Purdy, runs the corner, and picks up six yards to keep the drive alive. Two plays later... Third and goal. Watch Gary Beeman. Oregon State still leading 7-0. Beeman turns, gives to Greg Jones, and Jones flashes over right tackle. Here is one of the master quarterbacks of this decade at work. As he gets Oregon State guessing in the shadow of their goal line. Sprints out, but instead of pitching this time, keeps it and hits the flag in the corner and scores for the Bruins. And Zinan Andrews Zishan. Nails the point after right through the middle, and it's a 7-7 ball game, 77 yards, 14 plays. Oregon State stops, has to give up the football. The Bruins come right back, first and 10 on their 48 as Beban throws to Busby. The play is good down to the Oregon State 42-yard line, 10 yards on the play. With just inches needed for the first down, Beban again goes to the air. This time he hits Dave Nuttall down on the 36, and watch the work of Nuttall after he catches the ball. If he had just a little more room on the sideline, he might have really gone somewhere. But unable to move on passes, fourth and ten on the 34, and position tries for a field goal from 52 yards. And remember, it was good. 52-yard field goal, and UCLA is in front for the first time in the ball game, 10 to 7 over the Beavers. Less than a minute in the half. Hauser in front formation for White Flat Oregon State. And it's blocked. 
Bischoff and Lepisto pouring in, and Clayman recovers down on the 16-yard line. So for the second time in the season, all of a sudden it looks like the block punt was going to be a big play for UCLA against the tough foe. It resulted in victory over Penn State. It helped immeasurably against Oregon State. Three plays later, it's Andrew Zishin for the field goal again. Pops it into the air from 33 yards. It is good, and the halftime score, UCLA 13, Oregon State 7. Late in the third quarter, as we continue highlights from the UCLA-Oregon State game, Inyers takes the football for the Beavers, first and 10 on the 48-yard line. And the big fullback, who was an all-conference linebacker of the sophomore, gets seven yards. Two plays later, the ball goes again to Bill Inyers. And on this play, the Bruins get the red flag. They are penalized for hitting late and piling on. So that moves the football to a first and goal on the nine-yard line. A 13-7 ball game. UCLA leading on the strength of two field goals by Zenon and Position in the third quarter. Billy Main with a foot football on the pitch out. Dances into the corner and goes over. Hit at the goal line by Andy Herrera, but falls in for the touchdown. And Haggard missed the point. It's a 13-13 game now. We see it here. UCLA's ball, third and 17. Gary Beaven still the quarterback. The option. He throws to Dave Nuttall, wide open on the 20-yard line. The play works for 39 yards. And the third quarter ends with a score still tied at 13-13. At the beginning of the fourth quarter, third and goal. As we pick up the action, Gary Beaven back, waiting to throw. Ball knocked down as he just moved it far enough forward to escape the possibility of a fumble. So it ruled an incompleted forward pass. Now out of Greg Jones' hold on the 16-yard line, and position tries for a field goal. It's good, and the Bruins have the lead over Oregon State, 16 to 13. Beavers give up the football. After seven unsuccessful plays, the Bruins have it first and goal now on the six-yard line, and Bill Bold in the quarterback runs it right in for six yards. Here, the Oregon State defensive bastion getting its toughest test of the entire game. Purdy, the fullback, grabs. Drag down, Harry Gunner, the first man to get him at the line of scrimmage. Third down, goal, on the two. Remember, UCLA held Oregon State in the first half. Oregon State now, digging in, third and goal on the two. Beban, again, penetration by the cornerback for Oregon State, and Beban is knocked down, losing eight yards on the play. Fourth and goal on the 10. Bruins leading 16-13. Beban wants to go for the touchdown. Good protection. Fires. It is intercepted by Wellicic in the end zone, and Oregon State is held first and ten on their own 20-yard line. The Beavers now move the ball from their 20 down to the Bruins 11. It is fourth and six, and watch Haggard here as he tries to tie the score. And it's good. And the score is 16-16, but still time to play. The Bruins ran eight plays, and with the ball on the 20, fourth down, Zenon and position was called for the field goal, was blocked by big Max Bowley. The 6-6 tackle jumped into the air and knocked it down, and the Bruins come off the field with a 16-16 tie against Oregon State. Quite a ball game. Well, well, ties don't hurt you that much when you're contending for the championship of the conference, and certainly UCLA was still very much a positive contender, and the next foe, an old foe, Washington. The hard-hitting hard Huskies coming to town in November, and the afternoon was very hot, 85 degrees. Washington won the toss. They elected to receive. The Bruins kicked off, and the ball game got underway after the Bruins took the Washington punt, a 57-yarder, down on their own nine-yard line, and this long bomb from Gary Beban to Ron Copeland. The play works for 67 yards, and all of a sudden, the Bruins are on the move. Again, Gary Beban goes to the air. He hits Dave Nuttall down on the 14. Dave gets four more on the ground. The ball is down on the Washington 10. The Bruins sky high for this one. Remember, Washington ruined the 1966 season for the Bruins with that 16-13 ball game up north. The Bruins remembered it. Jones at left tackle for two yards. Now watch Beban step back here and fire for six. Greg Jones runs for the flag and scores. And in three minutes, the Bruins are on the board. After the conversion, it is seven to nothing. Again, the Huskies cannot move it. The Bruins get it back, take it on the 45. And Jones... Hits ahead for five yards. Second down five on the 40. And Greg Jones again with the football. Breaks loose over the left side. Runs away from tacklers. 
and turns it on. Into the corner and a touchdown. So in less than six minutes, the Bruins are leading Washington 14 to nothing. Three series of plays later, the Bruins take the ball first and 10 on their 39. Jones for five yards. Second down, 544. Rick Purdy gets a big play here as he cuts back and gets a big block in the middle of the line, runs over a couple of white shirts and picks up 12 yards. Ball now in Washington country as Gary Beban keeps at right end. 14 nothing, and from the very outset, UCLA is literally blowing Washington off the field. Beban back, fakes, gets a great block, fires on the pass to Rich Spindler, and Rich takes the ball down to the Washington 27-yard line. First and 10. Watch the fake of Gary Beban. Shows the football, spreads the secondary, fakes the pass, gets the block, turns it on, touchdown, and it's 21 to nothing in the first quarter. And the Huskers are wondering what hit us. Unable to move after that, Washington's Martin punted to Mark Gustafson. Watch the return. Martin, one of the top punters in the country, great day kicking against the Bruins. Had it not been for his foot, the score might have been much higher. Gustafson watches his wall of blockers form. There's one, two, three blocks, runs away from another man, keeps his balance. Now he gets to the sideline and turns it on for a return of 40 yards. On the first play, Bill Bolden at quarterback. Big sophomore from San Diego. Turns it on around the corner. Picks up 10 yards. Bolden shaken up, leaves the ball game. Beban comes back in. The drive continues in six plays. They're down in the shadow of the goal line. Mike Garrett now at fullback for UCLA. And Garrett dives, scores. It's 28-0 off the successful conversion in the first half. Washington goes to the air. The Huskies obviously staggered, trailing 28-0 in the first half of the ball game. Sean McKinney wants to throw. Does. Intercepted by Sandy Green, and the Bruins are moving again. Great afternoon for the Bruins fans who have suffered many times against these Washington Huskies. They love it. First and ten on the Husky 36. Beban throws. Nut all. In zone. Juggles. Holes. Touchdown. It's 35 nothing. UCLA leading Washington. And Nut all just threw a $25 football into the crowd. But nobody seemed to mind. The Bruins were to score one more time before halftime. Here, first and ten on the 42. Beban goes for the bomb, sets himself, good protection, Busby's down there, and Busby makes the catch in the end zone for a touchdown. The point was blocked, and at halftime it was UCLA 41, Washington nothing. Third quarter, scoreless, fourth quarter, fourth and 14, Dave Nuttall holding, Zenon Andrews Ishan trying for the field goal, 58 yards, it hit the goal post. Believe it or not, no good. The Bruins scored once more in the fourth quarter, and the final tally was UCLA 48, Washington nothing. That's the highest score ever run up by a UCLA team against Washington. And next for the Bruins, the big one. The one game that can make or break an entire season. This one had a lot at stake. National prestige, the Rose Bowl. USC had been beaten by Oregon State, UCLA tied. So USC had to have the win in order to get the bid. Remember what happened? Well, let's look at some of the highlights from the game and relive it because it was one of the great college football games of all time. And UCLA, after toe dancing for a couple of offensive series, USC probing cautiously for a couple of series. Finally, we pick up the play. UCLA's ball second and 10 at the USC 47. You just saw Dave Nuttall catch a Gary Beban pass for 12 yards and a first down. On the 35 now, it is first and 10. Ball is on the USC 35. Trojans in the dark shirts, the cardinal colors, the Bruins in the blue, the light. Gary Beban, the quarterback. His last chance to work against the Trojans. He picks up 10 yards, 11 yards. It's another first down. Gary Beban, slow to get up, hurting in the Washington game. Had a couple of ribs separated. There were times in the USC ball game when it did not appear to be possible for the man to walk back on the field, but he kept coming back. Five plays later, second down, 10 on the SC-12. Greg Jones, touchdown! And Jones goes in for the first score of the ball game with a great individual effort. The kick is good, and UCLA leads the Trojans 7 to nothing. The UCLA defense, very strong and tough. They hold the Trojans for two more series. First and 10 here on the SC-34. Beban throws to Spender. The pass is good. 
And he is wrestled down after 10 yards and another first down. Two plays later, third down and five on the 49-yard line. Gary Beeman back in there at quarterback, sore ribs and all. Throws back across the field. Pat Cashman reading the play just right. Flashes across for the interception. And Cashman dashes in from 55 yards. The kick is good by Ricky Aldrich. And the score is tied. Seven and seven. And the battle is on. The kind of a game that everybody expected. Both clubs having trouble moving in the second quarter. So fourth and three on their own 20. USC punts. Out to the 43-yard line. As Mark Gustafson turns in a brilliant return before he is finally cut down by the Trojans. Mark Gustafson, who is the sole returning veteran in the deep secondary for UCLA in 1968. Unsuccessful at trying to move the ball in for the touchdown. Here's the try for the field goal from the 23 by Andrew Zishin. He hooks it up and it is wide to the left, no good. Out of Greg Jones' hold. So USC has the football first and 10 on their own 20. Earl the Pearl McCullough. He figures in this play. Watch. Number 22 gets the ball on the reverse from his wingback position. Turns the corner. One of the fastest human beings in the world. And he is finally caught. Slowed down. Dragged down. Fumbled. Scarface recovers for USC. And the play is good for a total of 52 yards for the Trojans. One play later, it's second and 10. Down on the UCLA 28-yard line. Steve Soggy is the quarterback. For the Trojans, O.J. Simpson, the ever-dangerous O.J. But Soggy keeps and throws, and McCullough is downfield to catch. The play is good for 13 yards, and it's a big first down for USC. Now, O.J. Simpson goes back to work. O.J. held in check to this point of the ball game by UCLA. Second down and eight yards to go. Watch Simpson. One of the fantastic runners of all time, and he carries for 13 yards in the touchdown. The point is good, and the Trojans lead midway through the second quarter, 14 to 7. But UCLA moves steadily in five plays, up to a second and seven on the 37-yard line. 14-7 SC leading. Beban back to throw. Throws long. Dave Nuttall on the sideline makes the catch, goes out of bounds, play good for a first down. Total 48 yards on the play. Bruins try. They cannot click on the pass. So Andrew Zishin is called on again from the 22-yard line to try the field goal. It'll be a 32-yarder. It is up. And it's blocked. And the Trojans get the football on their own 42 after Greg Jones had picked it up and finally been knocked down. But it was a moment of excitement that did not amount to too much after the kick had been blocked. The halftime score was 14-7. to The Trojans still leading. No luck for SC in the third quarter. Bruins have control, first and 10 on their 43. And Jones hits at the left side of the line, gets four yards. Now, watch this play coming up very carefully. UCLA's ball, second down, six on the 47-yard line. All Americans all over the field. As we mentioned, the conference championship, the Rose Bowl, tremendous national prestige, all at stake here before a sold-out Coliseum. And I'll say it again, this was one of the greatest collegiate football games that I've ever seen. Second down and six for the Bruins. Beban, back to throw. George Farmer, downfield. Beban sees it, fires. Farmer gets it on the 20. Goes, touchdown, 53 yards, and the Bruins are in a position to tie it. And position's kick is good, and it is a 14-14 ball game. USC's ball here, 39 on the UCLA 28 as we pick up play in the first play of the final quarter. Toby Page, the quarterback, he throws. Intercepted by Andy Herrera for UCLA. He fumbles it, picks it up, brings it back for 18 yards. Two plays later, it'll be second down and 10 for the Bruins. Gary Beban going back and forth to the sideline with those painful ribs just back in the game. He's back to throw. Tipped at the line of scrimmage, not all. A sensational diving catch for 16 yards and a first down. And the Trojan Rooters being exhorted on the sideline. Literally fill the air with thunder. Each play getting more and more important. First and 10. Beban goes back to the air. Throws for Greg Jones. It's complete on the 28. It's another first down. Two plays later. Gary Beban stays in the air, connects with Dave Nuttall down on the four-yard line and watch the effort of Nuttall after the catch. Touchdown! And 
and the Bruins have the lead 20 to 14. Perhaps the most important moment of the entire football game came when the extra point try was blocked and UCLA's lead remained 20 to 14. Zeta and Andrewsition kicked off then to O.J. Simpson. Simpson on the goal line comes racing back up the field. Every time this man gets his hand on the football, you hold your breath. He brings it back to the 34, first and 10. USC's football, final quarter. Bruins lead six points. Simpson, the man of the hour, all year for USC. When the final game was played, it was true that Simpson was truly the man of the year in collegiate football. On the other side, wearing the blue, the young man who was to claim the Heisman Trophy, the most coveted award in football. Right here, you know the ball is going to go to Simpson. He bangs into the middle for three yards. The Bruins hold him down. Then they help him up. Don't make him mad. Getting late in the ball game. The Bruins are leading by six points. Toby Page, the quarterback. He's back to throw. Under pressure. Going to run. And the Bruins chase him out of bounds. He's a yard short of the line of scrimmage. So it is third down and eight yards to go for USC on the 36-yard line. On their own 36-yard line. And here a play that ranks as one of the more remarkable plays of recent history in college football. And one of the great individual efforts in all the history of college football. It had been a game of heroics on both sides. This one was the capital. Number 32, watch it. O.J. Simpson, 64 yards for a touchdown. An incredible run by Simpson. Ricky Aldrich, just as calm as you please, knocked it through. That made the final score 21 to 20. What a way, what a way to end a football season. UCLA had one more game to play. That was a loss to Syracuse, but that was anticlimactic. Anything that happens after the SC-UCLA game, I guess, is always anticlimactic in this part of the country. So the Bruins wound up with a record of seven wins, two losses, and one tie for 1967. 1968 will be just about as exciting as ever. We'll look at the 68 schedule a little later.